Amy. I am the Globe Trotting Stitcher and I am back for episode number five, take two. Um, what those of you who are watching this at home don't realize is that this is the second time we're filming this episode and we're a bit behind schedule. So you may notice a bit of a delay between um, when the last video was posted and when this one goes up. So we had filmed it on schedule as planned. And um, then when we watched the video back afterward and Gary began to get ready to do his editing process, uh, we discovered that there had been some technical difficulties um, in the filming process. And so the video was not going to be usable, unfortunately. Gary happened. <laughs> it was not Gary's fault. It was, <laughs> it was the whatever. The right balance. <laughs> it, was, it was technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, it and fluctuated. It fluctuated. There was there were color changes. It Big was time. <laughs> unplanned color changes. Um, so we had it was like living in New England. <laughs> <laughs> it was magnificent. Let yeah, me tell you. Well, crazy. he told me that he told me that he didn't think the video would be usable, and I could not bring myself to believe him. And so I watched it, and and I realized that unfortunately he was quite right, as he usually is. Um, in addition yeah, to yeah. in addition to the uh, the color change problem that the technical issues, um, Sophie usually all, well she always lays beside me on the floor while we film and she fell asleep that day while we were filming and and I knew she was snoring uh, while we were filming but I didn't think the mic would pick her up and not only did the mic pick her up but the volume of her snoring gradually increased over the course of the video until she was quite loud at some points. Um, yep. So we decided let's just reshoot this. So this video might be a little bit longer than a normal floss tube just because um, we're going to cover all of the content we covered in that video as well as adding in the new content that of things that have we've done since we filmed that. that so makes my job easy. <laughs> He's lying. <laughs> Um, so what have we been up to? Uh, because we're covering more time and this is this is old, old news for you guys, but um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, it's been several weeks ago now, but we had a quiet 4th of July here, meaning that we were very quiet and everybody around us was very loud. Um, we live in an area where people enthusiastically put off fireworks. Um, and unfortunately, poor Bear and Sophie are both very much afraid of all the big booms. And so we generally stay home every year to be with them and to try and keep them calm and, and create as much background noise in the house as possible so they don't hear as much of it. Um, and usually, you know, someone from our family will come over and we'll cook out a little bit. So we have a bit of a celebration. And this year, just with all the COVID stuff, um, it was just the two of us. So we did cook out on the, on the barbecue and... Other than that, we, we just had a, a quiet day inside with lots of fans and dishwashers and such. Um, we also had some good friends of ours who got married 4th of July weekend, and, and they had originally planned to have more of a big celebration with family flying into town. And of course, with the virus, um, they had to cancel or postpone that celebration until maybe next year, but they still wanted to go ahead and get married. And so... Um, they got married on July 5th and it was just such a special thing for us to be a part of. There were just a couple of us, um, who are among their closest friends. So, you know, maybe, um, four or five couples who went and there was just a little backyard wedding and, um, uh, it was really, it, I just, what I really loved about it was it felt like one of those old fashioned community weddings where everybody sort of pitches in, um, and it's not the big production. And so I made... I made pink champagne cupcakes, which I, if I do say so myself, they were quite tasty. Um, and Gary, of course, took some beautiful photos and did, did a wedding video for them. And all of the ladies, we just sort of pitched in and we brought whatever, you know, whatever we had that could be used for decoration. Um, and then some, another couple made some finger foods so that nobody had to share serving utensils. And so it was just this really special, intimate, um, quiet ceremony and we really enjoyed that. So we're, we're, we were so honored to be a part of it and we're very happy for them. Um, other than that, Bear is recovering well. Thank you again to everybody for all your good wishes for him. So he's now officially been out of the cone for a couple of weeks. He is very happy about that. Sophie's very happy about that. Um, he went in for his first round of follow-up x-rays with the vet and she was really delighted with how he's healing and she said he looks really good. Um, we were a little bit concerned because, you know, we're now over a month out beyond his, his surgery and he's still limping. And so we were a little bit concerned that, you know, is that a sign of a problem? And, and the vet said, nope, as long as he's continuing to improve on a regular basis, it's very normal for him to still be a little bit lame at this point. So 
um, he's definitely feeling better. And actually in the last week, we've seen more signs of him feeling back to his old self. So he's doing really great and we all appreciate your good wishes for him. Um, we also wanted to say thank you so much for the enthusiastic welcome to the voice from beyond and the voice of reason, AKA my husband, Gary, who decided to make a, a surprise, uh, not appearance, but verbal uh, intrusion. <laughs> into the video last time. Um, I was not expecting it, but it certainly delighted me. I thought it was really fun to have Just him. Going. I thought it was really fun to have him. I wouldn't him. normally do this. Oh my goodness. Here we're we go. More technical difficulties. Now it's out of frame. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, people. It's a circus here. <clears throat> um, anyway, we really, uh, it was really fun that all of you enjoyed having him around. And so I think he'll probably will be, um, will be popping into videos now and again and, and uh, making himself known because uh, I think everybody enjoyed having him join us. So um, I wanted to respond to a few questions and comments that have come in on the videos um, and um, let people, yeah, just respond to some of those questions. So the first one, um, Melba Burwell said that she, so you might remember a few episodes ago, I showed you the three patterns from Hannah's Needlecraft, the Bush Market, um, and um, roadside sellers, and then there's another one, and they're all these African market-themed uh, cross-stitch designs that were really beautiful. Um, and so many of you really, really liked those. And Melba Burwell said that she really loved those um, and that she wanted to go check them out. And she, all, she has said that she would love to find some other projects like those. And so I thought I would share just a couple of resources for those of you that are interested in patterns that um, that really highlight the flavor and um, the culture of other places um, because it's not always easy to find those styles. And so I wanted to share a few places um, that, uh, that have similar designs or um, more, um, more culturally diverse uh, styles of patterns. Um, so first of all, I will say the best resource that I personally have found so far is Etsy. Um, there's a lot of shops that will have, you know, little, little um, designs or options. And so a few Etsy shops that, um, that I've seen that had some really beautiful patterns that I liked that are of a similar flavor. There's a shop called Mosico, and I'll include links um, and include these names in the description box below so you can go and find them and look for yourself as well. Um, there's a shop named Mosico that had some really nice designs. Um, another one called Little Polish Needle. Uh, another one is Axibe. And then uh, there's Busby Designs. One of the things, um, the Busby Designs ones, um, I really liked, they had, uh, it's like the silhouette of animals. So like elephants, giraffes, that kind of a thing. And it's, so it's the silhouette, but then it's got like designs and um, almost like henna, a henna design inside the animal. And so they're just really fun and they're really neat. And it kind of brings that flavor. So I really liked those. Another um, another great resource I would love to highlight is many of you know Yanni Stitcher. She's a fellow floss tuber, and um, she is. If you're not watching Yanni, you are missing out. She is absolutely delightful to watch, and I I never miss any of her episodes. So Yanni is in Mexico, and she films floss tubes both in English, and then she also has a separate series that she films in Spanish. Um, and she, oh my goodness, she stitches such beautiful things. So she, she has a lot of mirabilias and lavender and laces, but then she, in the last year or so, has started stitching a lot of samplers. And uh, so she's, she's always stitching something new and beautiful, and she's enabled me more than once. Um, Yanni is also, so one of the things that, um, because she's in Mexico, she has a much harder time getting a lot of the, the, um, like the, the flosses and the fabrics that we have more ready access to in the United States and in Europe. And um, she can order them, but it, can, it takes a long time to get those products. And so what she does is she just buys fabric and thread locally, and she does a lot of her own dyeing. Her fabrics are absolutely stunning. I mean, her, she, of all of the dyers that I've seen their work, her work is some of my favorite and I have thought more than once, my goodness, I wish she had a shop because I would buy all of her fabrics. They're so beautiful. But she, I want to say a year or so ago, started doing a little bit of designing as well. And one of the things that I really enjoy about Yanni's designs is she, because she loves those traditional samplers, she kind of brings and she marries the, that 
that sort of a traditional sampler design with these elements of Mexican culture. And it, it just creates this new, completely different sort of style that is unique to Yanni. And um, I really encourage you to go and check her work out because it's just beautiful and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful example of, of marrying um, what you would typically see in cross stitch with someone's, um, you know, the celebration of their own culture. And it's just really special. So Yanni is, an, is another great option if you're looking for, um, for charts that have a little bit more of a, a cultural flavor to them. And then also another floss tuber that I wanted to talk about is Letitia, the crafty curator. Um, Letitia is one of those floss tubers who I swear she's one of the originals. She's been filming for a number of years now and I am always inspired um, when I watch Letitia's videos. She's one of those individuals that every time I watch her, I think, oh my gosh, I wish I knew her because I just feel like she would be such a great friend to have in your life. Um, and she is, she is really, I'm just, she's always finding new charts and new designs um, where, you know, and so Letitia, in addition to, to having, um, finding charts that are very culturally diverse, she's also great with, uh, with color conversions for skin. And so I've seen over the years, she's done a number of color conversions. Um, and so she gives and she shares those when she's done them. Um, so I would check out Letitia. I know she purchases a lot of, um, she's ordered a lot of kits and charts from um, more of your non-traditional um, um, shops. So I think AliExpress and maybe a couple of other places. So she would have some great suggestions on where to find some of those things. Um, and then finally, uh, the Lenarte or Lenart, I'm not sure the proper pronunciation, but they do a lot of kits and they have a wonderful series called the culture series. And if you like stitching beautiful ladies or pretty ladies, if you like stitching the mirrors and the lavender and lace and, um, you know, some of those types of, of designs, you may really love the culture series from Lenarte because what they do is they take beautiful women, um, and they really highlight those women in their traditional cultural clothing. And so there are charts of African women. There are charts of, um, you know, some like traditional European clothing, Middle Eastern women, Indian women, Asian women. And it really just highlights and celebrates the beauty in all these different countries. Um, and so I really encourage you to check those out. Every time I go onto their page, I want to buy everything. Um, and so they have some really wonderful options I know Luda from Cross Stitch with Luda has done several of their designs and they've just turned out beautifully. So check that out. Um, so yeah, I was just, I, I thought it was really exciting to see how many people were interested in those charts. And I also, I really loved it. I got a comment from um, a lady from Guyana. Her name is Jenny. And Jenny, I apologize if I don't pronounce your last name correctly. I think it's Rahabai. Um, but she was saying that she really enjoyed particularly the bush market chart because it um, it was it reminded her of the markets where where she grew up. And she was saying that, you know, my grandmother would have been one of those ladies who had her herbs out on the ground um, and selling at the local market. And I just thought that was so amazing because here's this woman from South America who has a very similar market tradition to um, what is still done in Africa. And I thought that that, you know, what a what an amazing example of the shared human experience that um, across continents and, and decades and, and centuries, we have this, you know, one of those common threads that so many cultures, um, that so many cultures share of the local market and people bringing their surplus to sell. Um, and so I just thought it was really neat that, that someone actually has that memory of that. Um, and you know, that flashback to their, their grandmother at the market. So anyway, hopefully that gives you some resources and just a sort of a place to, to jump off in looking for some of, uh, those kinds of designs. So the next question was from Gretchen Gantner and she said on your Celtic autumn, you talk about starting the next diagonal. How is this done? Is it in boxes of 10 or another way? So I thought, um, first of all, I will say we are planning to film a separate video, like a side video where I'll talk a little bit in more detail about how I stitch on the diagonal. Um, and another really great resource for this is Brian. It's behind schedule too. <laughs> yes, as so many <laughs> things are. <laughs> Brian Blitz Stitch is a great, I actually, <clears throat> 
got the concept of stitching on the diagonal from Brian, and he's also a great resource for this. Um, I'm going to show you this. Please don't steal the chart. I mean, I know it's far enough away. You probably can't, but we all know that we try not to share charts. And so, um, but I just wanted to show this as an example of really roughly how I start. So when I have a chart that I'm getting ready to stitch, what I will do is just take a ruler um, and instead of stitching in columns that are 10 squares across, I stitch in diagonals that are 10 squares across. And I will, um, I will use the corners of the columns that are on the chart and just draw, you know, use a green highlighter to draw a line all the way down. And then um, instead of stitching in those columns, I'll just stay within that. And I'll work my way down, and then when I get to the end of wherever, you know, I'll work my way down with each thread, and then when I get to the, to the bottom, um, or finish off a color in that diagonal, I'll park it in the next diagonal um, where the next first stitch would be. So again, we'll, I'll show more detail on this in a separate video, but just wanted to kind of give you an example of, of how I do that with stitching on the diagonal. Um, and I really, I really enjoy stitching that way. It's quite a lot of fun. Okay. <clears throat> Um, Jennifer King, so many of you might remember, I think it was actually as far back as my first floss tube episode, I was sharing about my full coverage piece that I'm working on, Rose Trellis In, and I was telling you that I was really concerned because um, I'm doing the, I've been doing it in the continental tent stitch. And what I was finding as I was getting across the, the top row of pages was that it was warping my fabric and I could see it sort of sloping to the right. Um, and I was, you know, kind of worried because, you know, I was thinking if this is what it's doing in the top row of pages, by the time I get all the way to the bottom, it's just going to be this diagonal design. And that is not, when you put several years into a project, that is not how you want it to turn out. Um, and so I had asked for any tips. And so Jennifer King responded and she suggested that I could try the basket weave or diagonal tent stitch instead. Um, and so what I ended up doing, I wanted to say thank you so much to Jennifer for that tip because it ended up leading me down a path and I'm trying something new. Um, so I started doing a little bit of digging around on YouTube to see what I could learn about the basket weave stitch. And I found a great video by Karen the Needlebug, another floss tuber. Um, and I should say, I've watched a number of Karen's videos uh, in the past. She is a phenomenal resource. This is a woman who has decades of experience with stitching. She knows so, so much. Um, and she, she's just, she's got tutorials and all kinds of, um, really great information. So Karen is a phenomenal resource. I encourage you to check out her channel, but she did a video about a year ago, comparing the basket weave stitch to the continental tent stitch to the half stitch. And it was so helpful because she actually specifically talked about how the continental tent stitch, if you use that all the way through the design, is more likely to warp your piece. Um, and so what she suggested is alternating between one row of continental tent stitch, then a row of half stitch, and then back to continental tent stitch. Because what that does is it actually pulls the fabric in two separate directions, so it helps to keep it from warping. Um, so I am trying that. I have now switched to that approach on my piece. Um, I don't know, hopefully what that will do is just keep everything straight going, going forward and that it will prevent any further warping. Um, I don't know if it will actually pull the part that has warped a bit back, um, back into line, we'll see. But, and it'll be another couple of months before I, you know, I'm able to see how effective, how effective that is um, in preventing further warping. But I wanted to say thank you to Jennifer because um, it ended up leading me down a path to get some more information and to find a new approach. And so I feel good about, um, I feel good about that. So thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the next question was from Barbie Jo Bonnet, and she asked if I would share my conversion on Oh Christmas Tree. So you might remember in a couple of videos ago, I shared my finished um, Oh Christmas Tree by Lavender and Lace. And I was telling you that uh, when I stitched that, I decided to do a color conversion um, to change the ethnicity of the little boy in the piece because I wanted um, I wanted the children in the in the piece to look to reflect my family because um, my family is mixed of of different ethnicities and so I wanted I wanted that to show up in my cross stitch I want everybody in my family to be represented and so um, I I made the little boy I tried to make him look African American. Uh, my husband has teased me more than once. He'll look at the piece. He's like, "Who's the Indian kid?" <laughs> Um, <laughs> which is fine because you know what? You know what? Give 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we are. Oh my goodness. At any rate, um, 
I think it's wonderful. So I may still continue to, to toy with my conversion, but um, at any rate, Barbie Jo is saying that she has a, a similar family and she really wanted to stitch that piece in that way as well. And so I wanted to share my color conversion that I've used. Just, just to be transparent, I may continue to tweak this in future designs, but um, I, and I will include this in the description box below so you can also go and grab it there. But for the skin conversion, I used three shades. Um, and this is from darkest to lightest. These are all DMC. Uh, I used 839, 840, and 841 for the skin. And then I used 3371 to do the outlining. Um, the hair color is a little bit more complicated because at least in that particular design, there are six different colors or shades that are used in the hair. And um, in, in this case, I, um, I ended up needing to use some blended threads to kind of get that gradation um, without going too far into the grays to get the highlight. Um, and so these, again, these are a little bit more complicated, but from darkest to lightest, that DMC conversion is 310 at the darkest, and then a blend of 310 and 3371, then just 3371, and then a blend of 3371 and 3021, then 3021 and 3787. And like I said, we'll put that in the description box so that you can you can actually easily grab it. But um, hopefully that's helpful to you. And Barbie Joe, I wish you luck in your conversion. I'm sure it will turn out beautiful. Um, next question was from Vicki Thalen. And she asked, where does your husband display his big boy toys? Um, because some of you, I'm sure, well, all of you probably noticed in the last video that as I was sharing my haul, Gary decided that he was going to insert some photos of his haul. Um, and so he got a few action figures, which um, he's, he's a bit of an action figure collector and has been for a number of years. So we have a couple of action figures that are scattered throughout the house, but most of his, um, most of his pieces are displayed. He has a music room and a, that's a music room slash office where he does a lot of his work. Um, and so he has got... They're oh. in a box. <laughs> They're in a box. She won't let me put them up. Let, mm. <laughs> I did four. I get four. We're moving on. <laughs> we have, we do, I will say, um, this is kind of a fun family tradition. So before Gary and I got married, he and his son, every Christmas, they had two action figures that are the Christmas action figures. And they're not actually Christmas action figures in the sense of being particularly festive, but it was just the two that they put out every Christmas as part of their celebration. And so those two action figures make an annual reappearance for Christmas. And uh, when our son is over, it's funny, I always notice at Christmas time, he looks to make sure that those pieces are out. So, but, um, so that's where the, the big boy toys are displayed is, is mostly in the music room. Okay, and the final question came from Julie Connell, and I thought this was a phenomenal question. Um, she asked, do you see any cross-stitch kits or patterns in the places you travel to, and do people in Africa do much needlework? So um, what I will say is, as far as the places I've been in Africa, and granted, I don't, I don't typically get out and do a whole lot of shopping, unfortunately. Um, so I don't, I don't know per se. What I will say is that um, I haven't, so I haven't seen any cross stitch shops, although I've certainly seen a lot of artisan shops and textile shops and things like that. Well, keep, keep it just for the record. Africa is a, a continent, right? It, that's a so very good point. You've only been to a few places there. So for, uh, for, from, you've been to a few, Africa is a continent. Think about this. Yeah, I've been to about eight countries out right. of many countries. Right. So if you just, I'm sorry, if you think about it, um, there's probably some cross stitching going on. There, oh, absolutely. But and the other we could thing. We find out and see what we can do. Yeah. yeah. And so, one of the things, and that's actually a really good point that I mm -hmm. wanted to make, is that I think people have a tendency to lump Africa all together as though it's one single culture, when in fact it's multiple countries um, with multiple tribal, heri you know, tribal heritages. Um, and if you go to Nigeria, in Nigeria, they have a fabric that they call Nigerian lace. And it's truly a lace, but it is nothing like any lace that you've ever seen in Europe or the United States. Um, it's amazing. I have an example of it somewhere that I should pull out and share in a video because it is absolutely beautiful. But the clothing that the women and men would wear, their traditional clothing that they would wear in Nigeria is completely different than what you'll see in Uganda, where women a lot of times will have these big, tall... Um, um, like not shoulder blades, not shoulder blades, but like um, the shoulders of their dresses are sometimes really tall, um, are the arms. 
Um, and that's completely different than what you'll see in Kenya where, where people, when they're wearing their traditional clothes. And so um, just to highlight that, yeah, Africa is a continent um, and it has very diverse cultures and very diverse um, traditions. Uh, and so, but, but what I wanted to do is share a couple of examples. So where I've seen embroidery, um, within African cultures, it's almost always, um, embroidery that is heavily, um, heavily uses beading. Um, so that is one thing that is very, very popular and common in African embroidery. And I wanted to share a couple of examples from some of the places that I have been. Um, so the first one is this is from a village. So one of the things that's really important in African, many African cultures is the act of gift giving as a way of giving honor. And if you're a guest in someone's village, um, a, very, very often they will, they, will try, they will offer you food or some produce or some kind of a gift. And so when I've had the honor of visiting villages, um, and, and visiting with, so a lot of times if I'm, if I'm going to the field, it's going to visit like a farmer producer organization where farmers are all coming together to aggregate produce or milk or some other, um, output from their farms, uh, because they may not be able to produce enough at a single farm to, um, to interest a, a producer or not a producer, but a processor, um, but if they aggregate the, their outputs and their um, their products from the farm into um, a big collective, then they can together sell that to a producer and um, and make some money. And so, some of the places that I a lot of the times when I'm visiting the field, it's meeting with these farmer producer groups um, and getting to connect with farmers and hear about their experiences and what is and isn't working for them. And so, um, this was a a hand beaded purse that was a gift um, that I received in a village a couple of years ago. I think this was from Tanzania. And um, they knew who I was and they knew I was coming. And so they actually used the beads to put my name on the purse, which just touched my heart so much that they went to the trouble of, of preparing for me like that. Um, and so the beautiful beaded shoulder strap and then the nice beading on the back. And these are, um, these are some nice big, looks like maybe wooden beads. Um, so, but this is a wonderful example of some African beadwork. Um, another example, and I think this was also from Tanzania, um, a beautiful woven purse. And you can see again, similar large kind of wooden beads. And then these, this beautiful beaded medallion in the center. Um, and this fabric is actually a very common print, um, within the Maasai community. Um, and so really, really lovely, but this is, this medallion is a really great example of common, um, a common beaded style within African, um, communities or within East African communities like Tanzania. And then the last piece I want to show you, um, as an example of embroidery and beadwork in Africa, um, this was from another farmer producer group that I visited a couple of years ago in Kenya. And this was a group that had really just had phenomenal success with bringing together the dairy farmers. And so they would all bring, you know, their 10 liters or 14 liters of milk that they were producing a day and aggregate that and then sell it to the local milk processor. Um, but because they'd been working together effectively for so long, they were actually starting their own bank so that they were having loans. Um, so anyway, this is another example. This is a dress that was given to me by a local official. I'm not going to open it all up, but you can see there's all this little hand embroidery here, um, beaded medallions, and then it has this beautiful belt with um, the shells that have been sewn onto it. So some wonderful examples of, um, of embroidery that and, and beading from Africa. So one last thing I wanted to add about embroidery from Africa um, before we move on to finishes is a, a website that I had found for those of you who are interested in taking a look and it's called African Folklore Embroidery. Um, and they've got some really wonderful, both just plain embroidery as well as um, embroidery with beading um, that is very much in an African style. And, um, and so I will include a link to that website in the description box, but a really another good resource um, that, that you can check out that will give you a sense of what embroidery looks like in different parts of Africa. Um, okay, so let's move on to finishes. Um, I had two finishes I'm really excited to share with you um, in the last couple of weeks. 
And um, many of you will remember, the first one I'm gonna show you is my January Cottage by Country Cottage Needleworks. Many of you remember that I was making really good progress on this. Um, so we'll show you a picture of what it looked like the last time you saw it. Um, this is a piece that I'm stitching on 28 count mushroom Lugana. Um, I'm using all of the called for colors and this is what she looks like. Now, one of the things I will say is that um, the snowman still needs his eyes and his little buttons down the front because I've decided to do those with beads instead of French knots. Um, and I have another, another design that I'm gonna be stitching on the rest of this fabric that I don't wanna cut this off yet. So I'm gonna wait and put the beads on when I finish the next design over. But for all intents and purposes, January Cottage is all done. I'm really happy with how it turned out. Um, I really love like the icy blue with the brown. When I see that brown, I just think of hot cocoa on a cold winter's day. And so it just makes me feel happy. Um, and this was, for whatever reason, this was a piece that I just really enjoyed working on. Um, so I'm really happy to have that finished and really happy with how it turned out. Okay, so the next piece that I had a finish on was my primitive Merry Christmas pillow. And we'll go ahead and put up a picture up of what that looked like the last time you saw it. Um, and many of you will remember that on this particular design, I was, um, uh, I had I had accidentally had a start with wh where I was, um, I misread the chart and I was using the wrong color of floss for the letters. It was supposed to be a dark brown and I had started stitching it in red. And so I had asked for everyone's feedback on what they thought I should do with that. Um, and many of you had some really great ideas. Definitely the, I think universally everybody said, we really like the red, you should keep the red. And I had one person that even suggested, you know, you should stitch everything else and then come back and decide whether you wanna change the letters or not. And that ended up being exactly what I did. And I think it will come as no surprise to anyone that I did decide to keep uh, the letters in red and I'm really happy with how this turned out. So this is the Primitive Merry Christmas Pillow. All finished. Um, this is by Abby Rose Designs. I'm stitch I stitched it on a 32 count gold natural opalescent uh, Belfast linen. And um, <laughs> um, so I'm really happy with how it turned out and I really love how festive and fun it is. Um, so right now I am planning to finish this into a little pillow. And right now I am picking my finishing fabrics. Um, I've never, well, it's been many years since I made a pillow. Um, and so I'm, I'm also watching some tutorials to get some, um, some ideas on how to do that well. So we'll see, we'll see, hopefully I don't completely ruin this, but, um, I, I think it's going to be fine. I think it's going to be really fun and I'm looking forward to, um, hopefully having some time to do a full finish on this in the next couple of weeks. And then I'll show you that when it's done. But for now we have a, a finish on the stitching for the primitive Merry Christmas pillow. All right, the next piece I, um, so those are all of my finishes. Um, and now I will show you the whips that I've been working on. So since the last time we filmed, I worked on my Celtic Autumn um, by Lavender and Lace Designs. And um, this I am stitching on a 32 count earthen linen from Picture This Plus. Uh, we will put up a picture of what that looked like the last time that you saw it. Um, this one, I will tell you, I have not, you'll see when I pull this up and show you where I am, I didn't make as much progress as I wanted to this last time around. I was, I was kind of disappointed in what I was able to accomplish. Um, but here is where we are right now. So what I was able to do, um, I completed two more medallions along the border here, and then I started working my way down and through another diagonal of the, of the gown. Um, I didn't even finish a whole diagonal in the gown, which was really frustrating to me, but this just happened to fall during a week that was exceptionally busy. I did not have a lot of stitching time. I had a couple of nights where I wasn't able to stitch at all. Um, and so I just didn't make a whole lot of progress on her, but that's okay. Um, it's, it's not about how quickly you make the progress. It's how much you enjoy the piece as you're working on it. So she is slowly but surely coming along. And I'm hoping that the next time she comes out, I'll have a little bit more time to work on her. But I think she is really beautiful. Um, one of the things that as I had mentioned previously that Olivia from Pumpkin Hollow Quilts is gonna be starting this. And I know she was working to get this kitted up. I don't think she started it yet. 
Um, but it sounds like a lot of folks who have seen this on her video are getting inspired and they're wanting to stitch it as well. And I know several folks that saw this on my video were also saying that they wanted to pull these out. So I'm, I'm kind of excited because it sounds like the Celtic ladies might be making a bit of a resurgence after many, many years. I mean, these, these designs are at least 20 years old. Um, and so I think it'll be fun if, if a lot of people start stitching them again. Um, it'd be great to see those getting out and getting a little bit more um, a little bit more attention again because they really are fun designs. So this is where we are. Um, and this one will be coming up soon for, for me to work on her again. The next whip that I worked on um, was my full coverage piece, my rose trellis in. Um, I am stitching my rose trellis in on 28 count white Lugana. Uh, this is a heaven and earth designs chart of a Randall Spangler piece of art. Uh, we'll put up a picture of what it looked like the last time you saw it. And um, this one is, um, so you might remember that the last time I worked on this, I had finished the top row of pages and I'd had a tiny little start on the second row of pages. And this one, I was actually really pleased with how much I was able to get accomplished um, when, I, when I pulled it out. So I finished several diagonals, um, and this is where it is now. I made it all the way across the top of page seven. Um, I'm almost to the bottom of page seven, the, the bottom corner, and I'm getting ready to work my way across. And one of the things that I did decide to do in working on this, um, on this row of pages when I was working my way across the top row of pages, I would only stitch one full page at a time. So when I reached the top of that page, I would just um, finish that single page before I started anything on the next page. Um, and my diagonals would just get shorter and shorter. And what I found was that there are, there are page, in the page breaks, I can actually see when I look at it closely enough, there are one or two places up here on this top row of pages where I can, where I can see where the page break was. Um, and so in order to avoid that, I've decided to just stitch my diagonals all the way across without breaking between pages. Um, and I'm hoping that that will prevent, you know, prevent those page break lines from showing up. So it takes, it ends up making it feel like it takes a little bit longer, but it really does. And it's the same amount of stitches. Um, so hopefully when this comes out again, um, what it, what should happen is that I'll actually get to start working a little bit on the roof of this, um, this turret in the in the Rose Trellis Inn. So I'm excited about that. But this is where we are and um, I'm really pleased with the progress that I made. I'm also really excited because I'm getting to the point now where it's not just gonna be all blues and, and um, yeah, basically different shades of blue. <laughs> it's I'm getting into some greens, I'm gonna get into some of the grays and the pinks and so it's gonna be really fun to start working in a new palette um, within the next month or two. So there we are. So that is it for my whips. Um, but because I finished my Primitive Merry Christmas pillow, I had enough time during the week that I worked on that and finished it to have a new start. And so let me show you my teeny, teeny, tiny new start. Um, this, is, um, this is a piece I've had for, a chart that I've had for a while. And it's another small seasonal chart. Uh, this is the, uh, it's called Delivering Plenty. It's by Homespun Elegance. And so I will share a picture of you of what that's going to look like when it's finished. Um, this I am stitching on 32 count Oaken Belfast Linen by Picture This Plus. And um, like I said, really teeny tiny new start, but I'm really enjoying it so far. So this is where I managed to get to. I'm using most of the called for flosses with this. And this one is um, almost entirely, I think the chart calls entirely for um, over dyed flosses. And so I, I am stitching with almost all of the called for, but there are a couple of places where it's literally just one or two stitches. And I don't see the point of using an over dyed floss if you don't get the over dyed effect. So in those places, I'm just gonna default to using DMC. But so far, um, I'm really enjoying it. I've managed to stitch two and a half pumpkins and started on the cart. Um, I don't think this one is gonna take a long time to stitch. I may even be able to finish it the next time it comes up on my rotation. And this one has been really fun to work on so far. So that's Delivering Plenty by Homespun Elegance. 
The one thing I did want to say about this particular piece is that um, it does have some some um, buttons that are called for. So there's uh, two, two buttons that are used for the wheels. There's a little squirrel, like a brass squirrel and a brass acorn. Um, and the brass squirrel I was able to order, and so I have that, but the brass acorn I cannot find anywhere. Um, and surprisingly, I haven't been able to find sort of like a rustic acorn of the right size that's like a, a charm. So if anybody knows of any shops that still might have some of the original acorns that were called for in stock, um, or something that would be similar, please do give me a tip because I'd really love to get that rather than trying to substitute something in. Um, but if I have to substitute something in, we'll make it work. Okay. So um, moving on to the next thing, I have one piece of haul to share with you. And the only reason I'm sharing, this is not the kind of haul that I would normally share, but there's kind of a funny story around it. So um, I think it was last weekend maybe, uh, Gary and I were out. Um, so many of you, I, I've been working on kidding up um, the, which chart is it? The, the bush market chart that I showed you a couple of weeks ago. And um, surprisingly, I, I have close to a full set of DMC because I've been collecting it as I've needed it over many years. Um, but quite a few of the colors that are called for for bush market, I didn't have. Um, and so I decided to go to my local Joann's and just pick those up. And um, my local Joann's, the DMC supply has been decimated and they just don't seem to be getting any more in. They, they have more... Um, more that they're out of stock than they actually have. So we decided to run down to Michael's, which is about 20 minutes from us, um, and try there. And they were much better stocked. Um, and so we were able to get all of the flosses that were needed. And as we were um, wandering around Michael's and just looking at other things in the store, um, there was a display of these boxes of DMC. And Gary pointed this out to me and he's like, you should get this. And I was like, well, I, I don't, I don't really buy those because I only buy the colors that I need. And I think those are probably whatever, whatever. And he's like, look, you had to go to two stores to get the, the, the threads that you need for your project. And he said, if there's a, if there's a shortage of DMC right now, you better get this because you might run out. And I was just like, be still my heart <laughs> because, um, I, I know for many of you out there, your husbands are like, you're spending more money. And so to have him be like, there might be a shortage, you better get it. And it turns out this is the popular colors box and quite a few, I mean, these are all really great colors that we tend to use a lot of um, in our designs. And so I actually, it was a really great idea that he had for me to go ahead and get this. And I got, I, I, I got a chest. He did. I turned it into a treasure chest. He turned it into a treasure chest. So he got this great little wooden treasure chest that he stained. And he's, um, he's getting like little jewels and things. And it's his project is really cool. We should show you a picture when he's finished working on it. But I had to share this because I thought it was so cute and so fun that he was like, there's, there's a shortage, you better get it. <laughs> so that's it for haul. Um, all, my, my spending frenzy is over. Um, and so the, the last thing I wanted to tell you about is uh, what I'm going to be working on over the next couple of weeks, and then we'll wrap this video up for today. Um, so the next thing I'll be working on is my Rose Quaker sampler. I am, I feel like I'm turning the corner into the home stretch on that particular design. Um, I will not be able to finish it this, this time on it, but I think um, as long as things don't get too busy and I'm able to put in normal stitching time on it, I think that I will be able to wrap that up um, after this rotation in the next rotation in August. So I'm really looking forward to that, um, both because it'll be just wonderful, a wonderful milestone to finish that piece off. And I'm also excited about what I have planned to start next. So Rose Quaker Sampler is coming up. Um, after that, I will be pulling out Celtic Autumn again. So we'll see how much progress I can make on her. Um, and then finally, I'm going to have one more new start. So because I finished my January cottage, I will be getting started on the March Cottage. Um, we'll stitch this on 28 Count Mushroom Lugana as I do with all of the cottages. And also we'll be stitching this with all of the called for threads. So really excited to get going on this. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I think that covers everything that, that I had to share with you today. So I hope that you're all doing well. I hope that you're staying safe. I hope that you're wearing your mask and that um, you're taking all the proper precautions.
And I hope that you are stitching on all the things that you love and all the things that give you joy. So um, thank you again so much for coming to spend some time with me today. If you like this video and the things that I have to share, I hope that you will like, hit the, hit the like button. Um, please do subscribe. Please feel free to leave a comment. Um, I try to respond to all of them. Sometimes it takes me a few days, but, um, but I always enjoy reading all of your comments. And um, if you'd like to get notifications when we put up a new video, just hit the little bell. And then you can also follow me. I try and post my progress every week on Instagram. Um, I am globetrotting underscore stitcher. So we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.